Okay, so we've gone fairly deep already on where the trappings of algebra come from. But we've also noticed that this story is far from complete. We know that somewhere in the 1500 to 1750 range, we go from an earlier form of algebra that didn't have symbols or equations, nor negative or complex numbers, just starting to make use of decimals. These decimals were themselves developing from Hindu Arabic precursors to something that looks familiar enough to our eyes to read without mathematical translation. We know that this stage of development happened first in Italy and then elsewhere in Europe. And I've given some vague indications that the earlier developments happened elsewhere. What I'd like to talk about in this section is what we've left out. Sure, we have a few names and dates, but really when you stop and think about it, that's about it. We haven't talked at all about what these places are like, their cultures, about the people themselves whose work came up above, about how math fit into their lives and cultures, and about a million other things. I bring up these specific unknowns because there's some that bring the greatest dangers of interpretation when we look back. Without these details, we tend to transpose our society onto theirs. Our assumptions about who does math today, why, to what end, become assumed of them automatically. We'll need to remember to come back and remedy this oversight later. And as we walk further back into algebra's past too, just how unfamiliar these 16th century algebra books are should give us some pause in how well we imagine we can understand the math and societies even farther removed from today. In particular, we always pretend to know more than we actually do about the ancient Greeks. Later, we'll see how algebra, the kinds of questions and methods that go beyond basic arithmetic in which today we'd use equations and symbols to work with, has actually been around for a very long time, going back at least 4,000 years. Algebra has come up in many cultures, including those in China, India, Egypt, Greece, and starting way long, long ago in what's modern day Iraq. As we continue back, these lines of influence, along with the historical records themselves, are harder to come by. But there's enough there that we can say we know something about algebra's early history and development. One thing I should remind you of though now, is that what we're tracing is not the first time any of these ideas ever came up in human history. So far, I've limited my storytelling to what lies behind a typical Western algebra text from today. All of this being downstream from European colonization at some point. And we've only talked about those innovations that caught on and directly contributed to this one thread of human history. There are other algebras out there. For instance, China developed significant amounts of algebra, often anticipating the West with things like negative numbers, linear algebra, and modular arithmetic. We sit in the shadow of colonization, and we didn't learn about China's early advancements until only relatively recently. Likewise, the invention of mathematical symbols I just went through wasn't the first time symbols were developed. Diophantus came up with a symbolic notation for algebra in the second century CE or so, more than a thousand years before the Italians started their own tentative symbolics. But his notation didn't catch on. Even though his work has mostly made it through the grinder of history and it's found other forms of influence, no one started using his symbols. Uncovering the reality of math and its history, even the tiny parts we've looked at so far, is not a simple thing. Each story we learn ends up being incomplete and needing to be discarded later, at least in part. We don't need to repeat all of the past's lies, but some incomplete stories help us understand a little bit better how to ask new questions, how to see subtleties. They help us find a way back from where we are to somewhere else. All the same, my advice is to remain very tentative when we pretend to have answers about what happened in the past. Like many other aspects of life, in math, we live with the consequences of what Europeans did back during their colonizing days. The math we do today in school is a colonial artifact. It may to appear to be neutral and universal at first, but this is itself a lie. It's not that the equations or theorems are false, but rather that what gets called math, where the focus lies, who we imagine doing it, how it is written and done, and other things like this are all heavily colored by where it came from. There are many parts to this particular perspective on math that we look back from. The way math looks on a page, and the organization of it into topics, you know, like algebra and geometry and trigonometry and so on. This extends upwards too. Today, math is one thing, and physics and philosophy are other things, and that comes from this historical thread. As we continue, we'll often stop to think a little bit, at least, about the specifics and limitations of our modern Western perspective on math. Right now, though, 
There's one other major consequence of being downstream from Renaissance Enlightenment Europe I feel that I need to at least introduce now, and it's the centrality of proof in Western mathematics. Europeans did not invent mathematical proof, but they imagined their work as carrying on the classical Greek traditions. There was a major thread of mathematical thought in that Greek tradition, where proof and being very particular about the ingredients that were allowed to go into a proof, I speak, of course, of the mathematical culture that followed in the wake of Euclid's book from around 300 BC known as The Elements. In the next section, I'll give a very brief description of the way this book is written and the style of doing math that it inspired. Because it has been so influential, this will also have the side effect of helping you to make sense of how mathematicians today imagine and approach their subject.